Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Marin Symphony broadcast, which is, as you can see, coming to you from a slightly different location than you've been used to. Um, this is my apartment in New Haven, where I've headed east for a little while. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm very happy to welcome as my guest this week, the longtime principal percussionist of the Marin Symphony, Kevin Neuhardt. Welcome, Kevin. Um, yes, it's great to, great to be here. Great to see everyone. I'm enjoying it and uh, we haven't seen each other in like six months it's been uh, it's unbelievable been too, too long a time too long exactly so i know what my first question is and i bet it's the first question that anybody would have that's looking at your your background um <laughs> what is if it's not too personal a question what's on going what's going on behind you there well it's a it's, it's, it's a typical uh, living room wall here you know most people have paintings or most people have their you know pictures of their families or children or something like that and i've got i've got some uh, tools of the trade hanging up here we thought they might be a little bit interesting for uh for viewing what, what tools for what trade if i may be tools of the trade. well i'm a drummer so a uh, percussionist and we you know, we can play things that you hit, things that you uh, whistle into, various kinds of uh, slide whistles or cuckoo whistles or anything you hit can be percussion. And these, these things qualify. And I've used them all in, in pieces that I had. This uh, lovely object here is a washboard, a washboard that is, it comes from a, uh, a company in Ohio and uh, you play it, you put thimbles on your fingers and you rub it across the, uh, the grates of the washboard and it makes a kind of a, a raspy kind of a sound. So you kind of tap the washboard with these thimbles. It's kind of like if you were like thumping on your table and you like roll your, your fingers when you're impatiently waiting for someone and you thump your table with that. And that's kind of how you end up playing the washboard. You, create various rhythms using these thimbles running up and down the washboard. And uh, on, uh, on the bottom of the washboard, I put some other kind of different kind of sounds on that. So that the shiny piece on the bottom of the washboard is actually a tuna fish can that I have <laughs> made on the bottom of the washboard just to kind of get a little, a little different sound to it. And the other shiny uh, brass piece there is a very small, very dense cymbal. So it kind of makes a little kind of a splashy kind of sound. So when you hit that with the thimbles on your fingers, it kind of makes a nice sound. You can hit the, uh, hit the wood on the instrument and rub it around. And uh, it, was, uh, it was for an opera that I did several years ago and a, kind of a Southern kind of a theme for the opera. And uh, so the composer wanted washboard in there. So we have washboard. So next to that is something that I, the, the first thing that drew my attention was the it's like a distinctly Indiana Jones vibe coming from this hat and what is either a, a snake or a bullwhip, but I'm, I'm guessing I'm a little off. Well, it's, yeah, you're a little bit off. The, the, this kind of spirally object is actually the horn of an African kudu, which is kind of like an antelope. And uh, what the kudu horn has, you put a hole in it, it's hollow on the inside, and you put a hole in it and you blow through it. So it sounds kind of like a, a conch shell mm -hmm. or a shofar or something like that. And that has all been, all been used. My father actually got that kudu horn a long time ago for uh, something that he was doing. And I just kind of inherited it and I've used it in several pieces also when they call for a conch shell or a shofar or something like that. And uh, so it's kind of hanging on the wall with the uh, washboard and the hat at the top is the appropriate headwear you wear when you're playing the shofar or the washboard. So uh, you can wow. uh, yourself appropriately. So it's all- This is the kind of thing you must learn in, in, in percussion studios. This yeah, the things they don't teach you in the conservatory. You know, it's like uh, you get out on the road and uh, you get in the real life of things and, uh, you know, things you just weren't taught. So uh, anyway, <laughs> interesting. Well, life. thank you. Thank you for filling in that mystery. Um, 
So let's let's go to percussion then, and, and which is your life's work. Uh, tell yeah. us how things got started for you in that department. Well, it was it was kind of a uh, nebulous trip to percussion. I I kind of started my my parents were not musical. The household really wasn't all that musical. Uh, they enjoyed easy listening radio, uh, and um, I guess about when I was around nine years old, my we kind of got a uh, piano, a spinet piano from the neighbors that moved out next door. My mom said, oh, we can get a piano. We got a piano. She said, okay, now you're going to have lessons. So at nine, my sister and I started piano lessons. And uh, that, that was okay. I, was, I wasn't really taken with piano, but I did learn music. I did learn you know, rhythms and notes and the basics of uh, of uh, music. And then a couple of years later, I don't know how this quite happened, but my dad all of a sudden brought down from the attic this very old snare drum, which he had when he was a kid. He never told me about this at all. And uh, so I had this very vintage snare drum and took it to school with me. They had a, a band at school and uh, I got 15 minute lessons like once a month. And uh, I knew the notes and new music. And uh, so I just started playing and basically we kind of uh, taught each other, the students kind of taught each other with the help of our uh, teacher that traveled around in the public school system. And that's kind of the way I was until uh, through all the way through with junior high school. So just basically happenstance, your dad brought something down from the attic and yeah, and that, and that kind of started thing. But I really wasn't sold on music then. I kind of, uh, during junior high, I was kind of getting my uh, teeth into science, actually. So I was very interested in science and uh, particularly oceanography. And when I was uh, 16, I, was, I had a pretty good aptitude for science. And when I was 16, I got the great uh, trip of... Uh, found this letter somewhere and brought, someone brought it to my attention about crewing on a sailboat, an oceanographic sailboat that did research out in the Atlantic for like a month. So when I was 16 years old, uh, lived in St. Louis, landlocked St. Louis. I took a flight out to Boston and boarded this sailboat. And we sailed from Boston to Bermuda first, then we went all the way across the North Atlantic to the Azores and hopped around the Azores and then ended up in Portugal. So if you can imagine this uh, trip when you're 16 years old, you're actually like working the sailboat, you're crewing the sailboat, you get uh, a lecture once a day on uh, oceanography, on marine biology, and I was just totally totally taken by it all. And it was just an absolutely fantastic trip to be on a, uh, on a sailboat across the North Atlantic. It was just unforgettable. So it's, uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, quite an adventure, yeah, absolutely. Not, not the average thing for a 16 year old to be doing. Right. But exactly. music won out over the, uh, at the end of the day, I guess. Did you, well, at what point did you feel away from, from the ocean and into the percussion studio? Well, I kind, of, I kind of started just before I left on this trip. I got really my first uh, professional percussion teacher. And he was from, he was new at the St. Louis Symphony and was taking on students. And I, I went to his studio for the first lesson. And I'll never forget this. I had my stair drum out. I was going to play a solo for him. And he said, you're standing wrong. And I said, what? I'm standing wrong. How can that be? The drum is up here. My sticks are up here. The sound is up here. He goes, no, you're standing wrong. And that kind of took on a whole new meaning for me with the nuance that he brought to playing percussion, listening to sound, listening to what you're actually doing, the sound that you're actually producing. And that just kind of, you know, kind of opened the floodgates on that. And when I was done with my trip uh, from uh, the sailing trip, I kind of found out that I was more liking actually sailing the boat and the, and the duties that were involved in sailing the ship as opposed to marine biology. So I figure, well, maybe, maybe uh, oceanography isn't what I'm, you know, what I'm all I 
I geared up for. And I, so I started leaning to music and the, uh, the music bug really bit me. So uh, from then I took off and kept with this teacher for a while and uh, kind of made my way all the way through the conservatory in St. Louis with this teacher. And uh, things just kind of budded from there. And you eventually came out to the West Coast, obviously. And I eventually that, came out to the West Coast. Was, uh, was that there specifically was no, there was, for a job? Or yes, well, as a matter of fact, I was. I was like, uh, I finished my bachelor's degree in St. Louis, and there really wasn't any freelancing going on in St. Louis. And uh, I had gone to, uh, in summers, I, was, I ended up at the music festival in Aspen, Colorado, and met a bunch of teachers, a bunch of students and teachers out there, and players that were far better than me. <laughs> And I realized at that point that I really needed to uh, start playing more in orchestras. And uh, I, I knew, uh, I got to know uh, Barry Joukowsky out there and he was a teacher out there. And he said, oh, come to, Saint, come to uh, San Francisco and uh, things are opening up there. This was in the uh, early eighties and things were opening up there musically. And in fact, that's where I met Ward Spangler. He was also an asshole. Long time member of the Marin so, Symphony. Uh, we are, you know, peers at the uh, Marin Symphony and have been <laughs> known each other a long time. And uh, it's all been a wonderful adventure. So, um, in terms of playing in an orchestra, uh, the percussion section has vastly expanded um, in the last hundred years or so. If, if it can be said that the 19th century was a, a major period of expanding possibilities for the brass and percussion with the introduction yes. of vowels. I think the 20th century, it's fair to say, belongs to the percussion. Um, uh, how many instruments uh, do you uh, regularly play? I mean, r roughly speaking in, at this point. Well, you have, you have to know the basics of, uh, you know, bass drum, cymbal, snare drum, then now you need you know, the mallet instrument, xylophone, marimbas, uh, tambourines. Uh, it, it's, quite a, it's quite a big palette of things. And cymbal playing, and it's not only the instruments you're playing, but also what instruments you're playing. Because when you end up playing cymbals, it, all the composer says is cymbals. It could be, it, you know, so it could be a small set of cymbals, it could be a large set of cymbals. It could be anything or in, for any kind. It could also be a suspended symbol. That's one of the things that both the conductor and the percussionist sometimes have to work out, as I'm sure there have been instances over the years where I might have said, oh, could you try that on a suspended symbol? Because it just says, you know, CYM yeah. for short. And who's to say whether it's two symbols clashed together or um, a Correct. suspended yes. symbol with a, a stick. Yeah, so, so we're, not, we're not given all that much. So we have to be a little more creative. It's not only the instrument itself, but what you hit it with. You hit it with a soft stick, you hit it with a hard stick, you hit it with a, uh, a snare drum stick, and the size of the cymbal. Every, everything matters. So what, what a really, what a good percussionist needs to listen for is who he's playing with and the nuance of who he's playing with and what, what the station of that instrument is. Is it, is it underlying? Is it supposed to be abrupt and uh, intrude onto the scene? Or uh, is it a statement? Is it underpinning? So there are a lot of different things going on. It seems to me that in, in some ways, uh, with, with a certain proportion of, of the repertoire, that you are in effect spicers. You're, you're deciding what kind of spices to put in the dish. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, the predecessor of the Marin Symphony, uh, my first conductor, Shandor Shalgo, he called con uh, percussion the confection of the orchestra. So I, uh, I kind of uh, have taken that to heart many a time. So it's kind of, it could be the sprinkling on top. It could be, you know, could be the main chorus also, but rarely it is, rarely is that. It's mostly colors and nuance and uh, sometimes pizzazz, sometimes it, uh, you want to have a kind of a sneaky kind of a sound to it where people sometimes a good bass drum roll is more felt than heard. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of different nuances you can, you can play to that. 
Now, the other, the other thing that people may not know about percussionists, and particularly uh, your role as principal percussionist, is that you are something of a choreographer, a, a ballet master, uh, that you have your section to deploy uh, and to set things up in a way that you can, uh, you can get from one instrument to another. How long does it take you to prepare um, for if there's such a thing as a typical piece? Well, it, uh, sometimes it's very easy if there are, you know, few instruments and sometimes it takes, you know, weeks of work to get the uh, proper choreography of an instrument together. If you're, if you're using multiple percussion instruments in amongst your own setup, it, you know, it could take, it could take a while to do that. And then if you're integrating, like very often when we have tops programs, we'll be doing uh, some very difficult modern uh, movie music. And uh, people are having to trade instruments, and you know more than one person is playing the bass drum or the xylophone or cymbals. So things have to be arranged in such a way so that player three is set up next to player four, and players one and two may be on the end. And uh, so there's a quite there is quite a bit of choreography and thought that has to go into uh, how things are set up because when you get to rehearsal that all needs to be done because rehearsal is a, a short period usually, particularly with a POPs program. So if things aren't in order right away, that slows the process down. Absolutely, and uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that because most, I, I think most people probably would not, there's no reason why they should know that it's, but it is a very complicated thing and it's the kind of thing you're only likely to notice if it goes wrong. <laughs> Right, right. I mean, if things go perfectly, nobody notices. Nobody knows, you don't get any credit, right? You don't get any credit. It sounds great. Everybody goes, oh, yeah, that's how it goes. And if something it's is okay, well, that's the, uh, you know, then well, you So uh, anyway. Here's, here's me giving you credit. And I, 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 I promise to be a sympathetic conductor because I do, I do know. I, I try my best. Uh, I don't always succeed, but always looking in your direction when I say, oh, let's go from three bars before letter C. And of course, uh -huh. you may be in uh, one different part of the piece and you all have to run around to figure out which part of the stage you need to be to access the particular instruments that you need. Exactly, exactly. So we're, yeah, we do, we do need a bit of time sometimes. So one last question, um, and you may have already answered it because it may be sitting behind you, but of the, of the dozens, if not hundreds of instruments that you have played during the course of your career to date, What's the most unusual one you've ever come across? What's the most unusual one? Yeah. The um, range well, percussion instruments. I don't know. I find, you know, there's the normal percussion instruments, but every once in a while, I will, I will find a real diamond in the rough. And actually, I, bought, I brought one with me here to kind of demonstrate to you. I'll Show and tell. I'll let you hear it before you see it, okay? Okay. Am I supposed to guess? You can guess, yes. One more, one more time. Well, it feels some, like some sort of temple gone. Yes. But are you going to tell me it's a, a can of Campbell's soup? Well, it's, it's close to that. What, <laughs> what this instrument is, I found this instrument in, uh, at, a, at a garage sale in Glen Park when I lived in Glen Park. And I stopped and I looked and I go, oh, that's a treasure right there and picked it up and it was fine. What I have here is a, I don't know if I can get it close enough to the camera here. You see uh -huh. It's a bunt pan, it's a cake pan. And so you can see it's got the hole in the middle of it and it's uh, right. aluminum, cast aluminum on it. And uh, you, you just hit it with a stick here. And you Fantastic. Can kind of wave it all around. <laughs> Well, at least I was in the right room of the house. <laughs> yes, it's, it's with all these other. Perfect. I think it, you could put that on the wall. It would make a nice uh, companion to the, the washboard and the and the. Ex exactly, exactly. So you kind of have to be a little resourceful. When we played uh, a couple of years ago, when we played the uh, anvil chorus, I ended up, instead of using anvils, I ended up using two horseshoes. And, it, you know, no one knows their anvils and they just sound fine. So nobody really cares. So it's, you have to be a little resourceful. And 
horseshoes are a lot easier to move around than an anvil. So I'm, uh, I'll say. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Excellent. Well, listen, um, it's been great talking to you, Kevin. I know that you have prepared a little musical treat for us as well, which we're going to see under a separate cover. But tell us a little bit about the piece. Well, the, the piece is a, uh, I'm going to play a vibraphone solo, and it's a, it's a piece that was made and probably composed in the around 1970, mid-70s. It's by a, 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 it's a guitar piece by uh, composer Ralph Towner. Ralph Towner was a, uh, a founding member of the group Oregon, which was popular in the 70s and 80s. And um, it's just a delightful, it's a small piece. It's a very calming piece. And I thought we could use a little calm in the world right now. So I'm, uh, I hope you can uh, enjoy it and uh, listen in and let your mind flow someplace where it's very comfortable. So it sounds I like the perfect medicine. Thank you, Dr. Neuhoff, for prescribing <laughs> that. And thank you for your time today. It's really great to see you. Um, and as, as we were saying earlier, it's been a while. And I, I do yes. hope we get to see each other again soon in person. Yes, sooner sooner will be better. So uh, Wonderful. anyway, great talking with you, Alistair. You too, Kevin. Thanks again. Bye right, for thank now. Thank you. Bye bye.